Hi all, my name is Anis and I am from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai and today I would like to speak on the observation of the different undertakers of carbon sequestration practices while examining their motivations for operation in a climate crisis scenario. To begin with, let us understand what carbon sequestration is. The understanding of carbon sequestration is preceded by the understanding of fossil fuels. We understand fossil fuels to be the product of years and years, millions of years in fact, of fossilized plants and animals. Fossil fuels are visible and obtainable through coal, most notably, as well as petroleum and natural gas. One of the issues with fossil fuels lies in the fact that fossil fuels produce greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases, we understand, are those which further accelerate climate change. And according to the International Panel on Climate Change, in their sixth assessment report, which was released in 2023, we are living in the age of the Anthropocene. Basically, human hand is now involved in every element of the world. This means that climate change is inextricably a part of our lives now, and we are responsible for it very directly. The problem also lies in the fact that we use coal as a, as a fossil fuel a lot. And what happens is that because we have limited reserves of fuels, we cannot always depend on coal. Now, we do know that there are renewable forms of energy, and by virtue of being renewable, we can use them infinitely. The problem is that despite its awareness or popularity, renewable forms of energy are not being used to the extent that they should. Now, what do we do in such a situation? And so to bridge this gap between the non-renewable non forms of energy and the renewable forms of energy, we understand and use carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration majorly takes place in three processes. So if you are aware of CCS, CCS stands for carbon capture and storage. If you take a look at the diagram, the carbon is first collected, basically through its derivatives, such as carbon dioxide. It is then transported to an ideal source and then it is stored in that source. Now CCS is available through natural sinks, such as most notably trees or forests, but there can also be human-made sinks, which we will explore further in the presentation. The important idea here to understand is that CCS is a mitigation technology. In the next section, we will explore CCS from a global local scenario. We will look at the global aspect and the local aspects of applying CCS as well as the stakeholders who apply CCS. How do we understand stakeholders? Stakeholders are those entities which have a stake in a particular event, in a particular conversation or a particular topic. In the context of CCS then, stakeholders include everyone who is involved in the actions of climate change. This means that every person is involved in the processes of climate change, making each person a stakeholder. Now, we understand that there are developed countries and then there are developing countries. This kind of bifurcation leads us to understand that historically, developing countries have always been producers of most of what we consume, while the developed countries have largely been the consumers. The idea here is that the developing countries have been greatly responsible for all kinds of production. The idea is that production through fossil fuels has always relied on developing countries. However, with increased globalization and increased urbanization, both developed and developed developing countries are responsible in both the production and consumption of fossil fuel related commodities. Further, Oxfam, an organization majorly known for releasing their reports on inequality, has said that the richest 1% in the world contribute greatly to climate change, more so than the poorest majority of the world. And each stakeholder is greatly responsible for climate change. In the next section, I want to take a sociological analysis of CCS technologies and those who employ CCS technologies. To begin with, it is better to obtain a clearer idea of the same through some theories. There is a theory known as the treadmill of production theory. And in line with what I said in the previous section about the developing countries as producers, basically fossil fuel companies or any company that is associated with any kind of production that is derived from fossil fuels obtains a profit because fossil fuel production and fossil fuel consumption is the name of the game. Fossil fuel companies continue 
to use fossil fuels even when there are visible environmental damages because they are aware that they will be able to obtain profits from it. Hence, fossil fuel production and consumption continues to go on, quite literally on a treadmill. The treadmill of production theory is also accompanied by the treadmill of consumption theory. Basically, all of this production leads to commodities which are then consumed, creating a cycle of production and consumption where fossil fuels continue to be used. Additionally, we have research and development across the world. In fact, one could argue that this particular presentation is also a part of research and development. However, in the Indian scenario, the government as well as other organizations have continuously focused on research and development. It is a matter of concern if we do not move beyond research and development, but otherwise R&D is very important in the climate change conversation. Finally, we also have the ecological modernization theory. In the ecological modernization theory, it is believed that in this stage of society, which we sociologically understand to be a capitalist society, stakeholders in such societies will be rational and will be able to rationally act on the climate change situation by em employing successful um, technologies to counter the climate change. However, this is a rather optimistic theory because it believes that these stakeholders will act very rationally. However, as we have seen in the treadmill of production theory, it is possible that they may not act as rationally and be motivated by profits and continue to use fossil fuel based commodities and rely on fossil fuel based production. A theory that ties all of these together is the interpretive flexibility. Interpretive flexibility is based on the understanding that you have the technical sciences or the physical sciences and then you have the social sciences. The technical sciences is where majority of the understanding and the technicality of CCS has come from, but the social sciences have also been able to critique the have been able to critique the factors that are found in the critical sciences. To bridge this gap, we can use interpretive flexibility. The idea is to not rely on either of the two, but to rely on both. To be able to go ahead in the climate change conversation for a successful result. The next section explores CCS in our country. Firstly, we have the earliest carbon emission oriented actions in India. Most notably, the clean coal technology has been found to historically have existed in this country. But over more than a decade, we have found the clean development mechanism to be operative in this country. The clean development mechanism originates in the Kyoto Protocol, according to which the developed and the developing countries were divided as Annex 1 and Annex 2 countries. The Annex 1 countries, which is the developed countries, invest in the developing countries in the matter of climate change. They basically offer resources, they offer monetary compensation as well as other kinds of technology so that the Annex 2 countries, which is the developing countries, are able to offset climate change. In this manner, Annex 1 countries are able to obtain credits while Annex 2 countries are also able to obtain greater security and greater confidence in going ahead with the climate change conversation. Currently, the Indian government has focused on research and development over the clean development mechanism at least up until 2030, which may be a matter of concern. Finally, CCS can be found not just at the global, but also at the local level. This doesn't just mean that we look at CCS taking place in India. We also take a look at CCS in the more local areas of India. It is possible through agroforestry and microalgal micro cultivation. Under agroforestry, we understand that about 12 to 20 percent of greenhouse gas emissions come from deforestation or other land use changes. In the process of agroforestry, specific species are planted such that they can develop into trees and further into forests creating smaller ecosystems such that they are able to act as natural carbon sinks and work in the process of carbon capture and storage, but they are also able to benefit the local farmer on whose property or on whose land these particular ecosystems are existing. Because we understand that trees are a resource in terms of medicine, in terms of food, and a farmer is able to benefit not just from all the other processes that the farmer would do on his land, but also through the trees that are a part of agroforestry. Finally, but flue gas from coal powered plants can then be transferred into algal ponds where the microalgae work on the carbon 
and are able to act as artificial sinks for carbon sequestration. Finally, to conclude, we have understood that there are multiple stakeholders involved, nearly where everyone is a stakeholder. We have also understood historically that at least in India particularly, we have come from clean coal technology to CDM. There have been challenges to CCS adoption, for example, because renewable forms of energy are limited in use, we are approaching the climate change conversation through CCS. CCS further is struggling to be adopted in wider use. Further, we have understood that CCS is heavy in the technical sciences and is understood and approached better from the technical sciences. However, the social sciences can explore factors like policy and the application of CCS technologies in our society. We need to understand whether our issues lie with technology or whether our issues lie with policy. Finally, a future without CCS means that we go past a point of no return in terms of climate change. Climate change only gets accelerated further if we are not able to use CCS technology effectively and within the stipulated period of time. This is why I believe CCS is crucial to the climate change conversation and to our future. Thank you.